Welcome back. In this video, we continue our study of chapter 3 and we move to section 3.2. Notice that I changed a little bit the organization of uh, the chapter and I added a fourth section. So, other forms of compactness. So, let us study some properties related to compactness. The first property is what we call total boundedness. So, if X is a compact metric space, then for any positive epsilon, we can cover the space by finitely many balls of radius epsilon. Okay? And this property is called total boundedness. So, a metric space, we need the assumption of a metric space because in order to talk about a ball, so such so a metric space possessing this property is called totally bounded, or in French, pre-compact. Okay, now this is very easy. This is a direct consequence of um, the definition. So just consider the open covering. Uh, so of balls of variable center and fixed radius epsilon. So the union of all these balls, as we know from chapter one, is equal to x. So we have now an open covering of x, and compactness of x dictates that finitely many uh, elements of this collection cover x. And this is the conclusion. And notice that actually we can replace open ball by closed ball, actually. Check that. Same thing. Let us uh, check directly by going back to the definition that uh, the interval 0, 1 was the usual distance is totally bounded. Okay. Now, there are other ways to prove that it's totally bounded, but let us check the definition. So, pick a number epsilon, positive, and choose an integer n strictly bigger than 1 over epsilon, and divide the interval 0, 1 into points, 1 over n plus 1, 2 over n plus 1, and so on, until n over n plus 1. Okay, so we claim that uh, the union of the balls of center xi and radius epsilon i from 1 to n is equal to cover x. Okay, so here we uh, this is the ball in the space. So by definition, it's the set of points between 0 and 1 such that the distance to the center is less than epsilon. So otherwise stated, as we know from chapter 1, this is just the usual ball in R intersected with the space 0, 1. So how to prove that? It's enough to take an element x and prove that it's in one of these balls. So uh, take j to be the floor function of, of nx plus 1. Then check that j is, in, is between 1 and n, and x belongs to the ball of center x, j, and radius epsilon. Okay. So why did I give this example? So first to illustrate uh, this notion, and second, to tell you that so a compact metric space is totally bounded, but the converse is not true. We need an extra condition in order for uh, a totally bounded metric space to be compact. Okay, now, second result is very important. It's called the Lebesgue number lemma. So once again, we have a metric space. And we have an open covering of X. I call it calligraphy K. So note that we can use either the index notation for a collection or the calligraphic notation. You choose the one you like. <clears throat> so here I denote the open covering by calligraphy K. Okay. So if X is compact, then there, ex there exists a number delta positive such that each subset of X having diameter less than delta is contained in some element of A. So only one element will contain the set. And such a number is called a Lebesgue number of the covering gate. Of course, the number is not unique because any if I find one number, anything smaller would do. Okay, so this is not difficult. If X is it, so we have to distinguish between two cases. If the whole space is an element of the covering, then any positive number would do. Okay, because any uh, subset of X is contained in X, which is one element of the covering. So we assume that X is not an element of the covering. Now, the compactness assumption tells me that I can cover 
the space X only by finitely many elements of this collection. I call them capital A1 through capital AN. And now for each index I between one and N, I take the complement of AI, call it CI. And I consider this function one over N times the sum of the distance between X and the closed set CI, right? Because AI is open, so CI is closed. And this function is actually continuous. Why? Because it's a sum of continuous function. We know that each term is a is continuous function of x, actually uniformly continuous. And I claim that f never vanishes, so it's strictly positive. Because if not, then the sum of all these non-negative, if f of x equals 0 at some point, then all the terms here are 0. But if all terms are 0, when, then dx ci is 0 for all i. But since ci is closed, this means that x is in ci. Okay, and therefore x belongs to the intersection of ci, which is the intersection of the complement, which is by De Morgan's law the complement of the union. But this is empty because we said that a1 through an cover x, so x is the union, and this is the contradiction. So this means that f is strictly positive. And we know from the previous section that f has a minimum value, and this minimum value is actually strictly positive because f of x is strictly positive. So uh, call this minimum value delta. So delta is equal to f of c, if you like, where c is in the space. So f of c is positive. Okay, this will be our required number. Okay, now take a subset B of X whose diameter is less than delta and choose a point X0 in B. Then it's easy to check by the triangle inequality that the set B is contained in the ball of center X0 and radius delta. How do you prove that? Take an element X here. Then, uh, since x0 is in B, the distance between x and x0 is less than the diameter of B, which is less than delta. So x is here. Okay, now, among the numbers dx0, c1, dx0, c2, dx0, cn, there is a biggest number. I will call it, this will correspond to the index m. So dx0, cm is the biggest among the numbers uh, dx0, ci. So, in this case, actually, the x0 cm is an upper bound of f of x. <clears throat> As you may check by going back to the definition, okay? Because if you go back to the definition, uh, each, each uh, term of the sum is less than the x uh, cm, okay? So, when I sum them, I get less than n times the maximum. So, cancel by n, so I get f of x is less than... Uh, yeah, so in particular, actually, this is, uh, yeah, this is actually f of x0, should be f of x0. Okay, so what do we have? So since delta is less or equal than this number, this means that the ball of center x0 and radius delta is contained in the ball of center x0 and radius this distance, okay? And now I claim that this ball is contained in the complement of cm, which is just am. Why? How do I prove that? I take an element here and prove that it's here. So take an element x is here. So the distance to the center is less than the radius. So we have dx0x is less than dx0cm. And this implies that x is not C in cm because by definition of this number. So this is the infimum of dx0x, x is in cm. So if x was in cm, then we would have dx0x bigger or equal than this. Okay? So this proves the, uh, the claim. And therefore, B is contained in this ball, which is contained in AM, so B is contained in AM. So one element contains the set of diameter less than delta. Okay. So this proves the Lebesgue number lemma. Okay, now uh, we talked uh, in, the, in the introduction about two kinds of compactness, uh, sequential compactness and compactness. And there's, there are actually many formulations of compactness. One of them is the concept of limit point compactness. So that you probably encountered in first year in the context of uh, bolzano weierstrass theorem. So it states that, uh, well, in the case of a closed interval AB, uh, any, any infinite subset of the closed interval AB has a limit point, or actually this was equivalent to saying that any sequence of closed interval AB uh, contains a conversion subsequence. So in general, the topological space is said to be limit point compact. 
if every infinite subset of x has a limit point in the space x. And the, a topological space is said to be sequentially compact, as we know, if every sequence in X has a conversion subsequence, and the, lim the limit should be in the space, of course. Okay, so it turns out that in the case of a metric space, all the three conditions of compactness are equivalent. Okay, so this is the content of the main theorem of this section. So if X is a metric space, then saying that X is compact according to our definition in terms of open coverings or uh, in terms of closed subsets is equivalent to saying that X is the limit is limit point compact and it's equivalent to saying that X is sequentially compact. Okay, so this is actually, it's not a trivial theorem. It's, it's, a little, it's a little bit hard. So this is why I'm going to prove it in the next video <clears throat> in case you are not interested in lengthy proofs. But I'm going to deduce a useful corollary from this. So, and just a remark, we'll see in the proof that one implies two is actually true for any topological space. So we don't need the assumption of metrizability. So another way of stating one implies two is saying that a compact and discrete space is finite. Okay, so discrete means that all points are isolated. Okay, so, a corollary, finite product of compact metric spaces is compact. Okay, now according to this theorem, using this theorem, it's easy to prove that. <clears throat> so it's, it's enough to prove that the result for a product of two metric spaces, because once we prove it for two, we can proceed by induction and prove it before any number of spaces. So consider two metric spaces, x equipped with dx and y equipped with dy. And uh, actually, the distances are not relevant here. Okay. So we equip here x times y with the product topology that we defined in chapter 1. If you, if you don't like this, you can equip x times y with this distance, the sum distance that we considered earlier, or the maximum distance, or the Euclidean distance, doesn't matter. But this is, not, this is irrelevant, actually, because compactness is a topological property. It depends on the collection of open sets, not directly on the definition of a distance. Okay, but if this makes you uh, <clears throat> feel more comfortable, you can take uh, this distance, but any other distance would do, actually. So then it's easy to check that the sequence of components x, n, y, n in the product converges to a point x, y, if and only if each component converges to the corresponding component. So, and this is, this should not be a surprise, actually. We, we define the product topology in order for this to make sense. And actually, we pointed out to this fact in the exercises, because if you take this distance, it's easy to check that this, uh, uh, this equivalence between saying that a couple x n y n converge to x y, if and only if x n converges to x and y n converges to y. <coughs> so this is easy, actually, because otherwise it would be really weird to not have this equivalence. So, okay, now I prove that x times y is sequentially compact. Okay, here I, I need the assumption of metrizability. So I want to prove that this sequence of couples has a conversion subsequence. Okay, so if we consider the first component, x10, this is a sequence in x, but x is compact, so it's sequentially compact. Therefore, xn has a conversion subsequence that I denote by x sub n sub k, okay, converging to some element x. And now, again, I consider the sequence y sub n, n sub k, which is a sequence in y. And since y is compact, it's sequentially compact. Therefore, y and k has a conversion subsequence, subsequence here, that I denote by y sub n sub k sub l. Okay? So what do I have here now? X, so since x and k converges, then x and k l converges. And therefore, the couple x and k l, y and k l converges to x y. So we started from an arbitrary sequence in the product and prove that it's convergent. Okay. Now, of course, this result holds for general topological spaces, but the proof is harder. But thanks to sequential compactness, uh, this is not, uh, so we have an easier proof. No, okay. <clears throat> you will prove that, in general, an arbitrary product of compact topological spaces come, but this is actually a deep theorem, deeper than that. 
Okay, so I think I will um, <clears throat> stop here now and I will prove the, the theorem 3.5 in the next video. So thank you for your attention and see you next time.